Ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll introduce you to the new beef ambassadors. Plus a report on how the Responsible Beef Program is helping cattle feeders. And advice on protecting your stored hay bales. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. We're glad to have you with us. Topping our news this week, it was an unprecedented gathering at Kansas State University just a few days ago. Six former U.S. Secretaries of Agriculture came together on the campus in Manhattan to talk about issues in agriculture. The panel discussion was moderated by K-State Ag Economics Professor Dr. Barry Flinchbaugh. With expertise going back more than 30 years to the days of the Reagan administration, ideas on the path to getting a new farm bill were a hot topic of discussion. You just look at all the challenges that the Congress and the President are looking at today. The debt problem, the budget problem, will we close down the government or won't we? Um, immigration and the farm bill. Listen, the farm bill is the easiest one of those things to solve. And they'll always do the easiest thing. They're gonna do the farm bill. How much of the other things they get done, I don't know. I predict the farm bill. I would really, really reach out to the House Ag Committee, the Senate Ag Committee, especially the leadership, the chair and the ranking member, because they can, they can put a farm bill together. Um, and I think that's, that's key. We need leadership from, from all aspects to get a farm bill done. I think what, what um, advice that I would give uh, my friend Governor Vilsack is get the Aggies in a room and get this thing solved. Um, the politicians in the White House, the politicians uh, in Congress, in the Senate, are causing problems. And if you look at the difference between the House and the Senate versions of the bills, um, they could be fixed very easily if you had the, the traditional agriculture-oriented, experienced, and talented people in the room and get it done. If I were he, I would, I would get him in the room probably against the president's wishes and say, get this thing solved. The farm bill remains one of NCBA's top priorities in 2013. To join in the effort to secure a new farm bill and address other key issues impacting cattlemen and women, become a member of NCBA. Just give us a call at 1-866-USA-BEEF or visit our website, that's beefusa.org. You can do everything right in raising and caring for your animals, but if you don't get the marketing right, you could end up limiting your profit potential. Joining us now to talk about those profit opportunities and the overall drivers in the cattle market is Kevin Good with Cattle Facts. Kevin, thanks for coming back to the show. Nice to be with you, Kevin. You know, those Cattle Facts sessions that you all do at NCBA's convention are always so popular. Can you give us any kind of highlight or insight into some of the topics you'll be discussing this year? Yeah, so during the Cattlemen's College, we'll, we'll present USB from Global Trade. Mm -hmm. And within that, we'll discuss some of the changing trends that we're seeing from a global standpoint and discuss why that's important to the U.S. cattlemen. Well, and I want to follow up on that. We hear a lot about the importance of international markets to us as U.S. cattlemen. Tell us just how important and how impactful those international markets are. If we looked at 2013, we're on pace to export roughly 10% of all the U.S. beef that's produced domestically. And that's going to be about 12% from a value standpoint of all beef. If you included variety meats, it takes it up to 14% of, uh, of beef value. And if you take, it, uh, take the hides included, it represents 17% of a fed steer or heifer's value is derived by exports. That's, those are serious dollars. I wanted to follow up on a couple of key countries that I've been reading a lot about. First of all, China. It sounds like we're importing a lot of product to China. And then a question about India. I hear they're becoming big beef exporters. Yep. Yeah. As you think about China, we have uh, we've got we don't have direct access to China as far as exporting beef, uh, but we do export a lot of beef into Hong mm -hmm. Kong, Taiwan, Vietnam that uh, may or may not go into into China one way or the other. China is now the world's largest beef importer from all destinations. And just 
12 months ago, they were number four on that list. So mm -hmm. they're, they're a very big and growing destination for global beef. And what about India? India, that's something that kind of ran under people's radar for a number of years, but in reality, India, if you include buffalo beef and their carob beef, uh, they are the world's largest beef exporter now, mm -hmm. which is um, takes you off guard, but, and, and it does, a lot of that product is going into the Southeast Asian market, and it does to some degree displace uh, some of the other countries that uh, uh, compete in that market. Well, let's focus a little closer to home now. What do you see in this uh, fall market for uh, U.S. cattlemen here over the next couple of months? Yep. You know, you have the global trade is going to continue to be supportive to U.S. beef prices as we go through the end of the year. Supplies are going to get tighter as we go into the winter period for fed cattle in particular. Mm -hmm. you know, seasonally, beef demand will get stronger as you go against the holidays. So. Yeah, you know, we expect the Fed market to go ahead and push up to 130 or above, you know, onto new all-time highs. It's very likely that that's where it could be by the end of 2013. And we also need to recognize we've got a record corn crop coming in the bin right now. Mm -hmm. And instead of uh, seven to eight dollar corn that we had a year ago, we're going to have four and a half, five dollar corn. And with that being the case, and the prospect for record high Fed values going into 2014, calf and yearling values both are going to be exceptionally good going through the fall. Could be a pretty bullish market. Absolutely. It's good to see you again, Kevin. Thanks for your insights. Thank you. Great insights on the cattle markets will be shared at Cattlemen's College 2014. It all happens in Nashville, Tennessee at the 2014 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. Register now at the website beefusa.org. The National Beef Ambassador Program, funded in part by the Beef Checkoff, works with youth in states across the country. These young people help educate consumers about beef and beef production. And each year, five college-age young adults are chosen to serve as National Beef Ambassadors. Let's head to reporter Sharon Alseth for an inside look at the Beef Ambassador selection process. Youth beef advocates from all across the country travel to Springdale, Arkansas to compete for one of just five spots on the 2014 National Beef Ambassador Team. The competition was intense, as contestants showed off their skills in four areas, including consumer demonstration, issues response, education and outreach, and even a media interview. I think this program is different because the seniors compete in four different categories. This isn't just a speech contest, it's not a judging contest. We bring in aspects that others don't. We have a media interview, for instance, because these kids that are going to be advocates are out there many times and there's a, a great event in the news. They want to know, what is a beef ambassador? Or why should I eat beef? Is it healthy for me? Or tell me about animal well-being. And so they've got to be able to be on camera and to be able to articulate our key messages. Our role is basically to tell the beef story and so what that means is we travel all over the country on behalf of beef producers, whether it's from California or New York, we are telling their passion, uh, their insights to what happens and takes place on their beef cattle farm on a daily basis. And so we take a lot of pride in doing that, but basically we are here to tell their story and to make a difference in helping bridge that gap from producer to consumer. We have got a gap in reaching our consumers and any way that we can get to that consumer so that they will be reassured about eating beef is, is important that we reach out to that way. And this is just one of the tools that we have as, as beef producers and, and it's a great tool because these young people can reach other young people on college campuses and help address their concerns. Uh, also, a lot of people are not afraid to talk to a young person whereas if you put an old, old farmer like me up there, they may not come up and talk to me. But when these young people respond, uh, people can't help but be impressed. This year, 14 beef industry leaders volunteered their time as judges, listening to and interacting with the young competitors as they did their best to tackle key beef industry issues. The event, funded in part by the Beef Checkoff, could not happen without the tireless volunteer efforts of cattlewomen from throughout the country. Here at the National Beef Ambassador Contest, volunteers are the lifeblood of this program and those of us that are invested in the program and have experience with it continue to come back because we love the results. We are addicted to the community feel of the beef community. The Arkansas Cattle Women have approximately 17 women here volunteering. The mission of the Cattle Women is to promote youth and uh, we feel this is one of the best programs that we have 
to get the best youth out there in the industry. My past experience with the National Beef Ambassador Program really actually hits home with me. I'm coming full circle back to Arkansas. So in 2009, I traveled to Fort Smith, Arkansas to compete in the National Beef Ambassador Contest myself. So not only have I had firsthand experience with this contest as a contestant, but now four years later I'm back judging, helping to choose the next National Beef Ambassador team. When the judging was done, the winners of the Beef Ambassador competition this year were Tori Summy from Arizona, Emma Morris from California, Sierra Jepson from Ohio, Rachel Walters from Tennessee, and Justana Von Tate from Texas. The competition and their year ahead is an experience they will never forget. I have met so many really amazing people and just hearing what they've done in their home communities and getting to share my beef story with them is really inspiring and just to hear how far they've come from you know, birth to where we are now is it's really inspiring just to see we as youth members being able to represent an industry that we truly love. We're funded in part by the Beef Checkoff, so America's beef producers have told us that it's important to create a pipeline of strong industry leaders, and so we, we absolutely appreciate that. The American National Cattle Women manages the program, and the cattle women for years have been uh, devoted to youth and you know helping them to be successful. And I think just all of the people across the country that help these these individuals you know feel like they've got the confidence and the skills to, to step forward, because we need them to raise their voices. People have uh, concerns, questions, and they just want to know where their food comes from and these advocates are, are wonderful. They have an immediate connection with their peers and we just need more of them. Now, five new eager and skilled beef ambassadors are prepared to spend the next year traveling the country speaking up for the beef industry. From the National Beef Ambassador Contest in Arkansas, I'm Sharon Alseth for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Isn't it exciting to hear those positive messages from these outstanding young people dedicated to speaking up for the beef industry? Still ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We really felt it was important for uh, producers to find their voice and to tell their story. We'll tell you about a new program called Responsible Beef. Plus, we'll have tips from the experts at New Holland Agriculture on how to store hay bales and protect your forage investment. Stay with us. You're watching NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen on RFD-TV. to versatility on your operation. Nothing beats a John Deere D-Series skid steer. They're not only great for cleaning and feed chores, but with John Deere Worksite Pro attachments, you can tackle just about any job thrown your way. You asked for versatility, and John Deere delivered. These rock-solid machines are built to last. See your dealer today. Welcome back. Members of the cattle industry know how much time and effort it takes to care for the land and the animals they raise. But that information often goes unnoticed by those who are not connected to the cattle industry. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter has more on a new program designed to help ranchers and cattle feeders tell their story. Cattlemen and women play a key role in feeding the world and they work hard to do it, but many consumers struggle to understand how beef is produced or who produces it. That's why it's important for ranchers and cattle feeders to take an active role in connecting with consumers and telling the story of responsible beef production. 
you don't have to be a professional speaker to do this. You have to be able to shake people's hands, look them in the eye, ask them some questions about what they're interested in, and relate to them on a human basis. It really is as simple as having a conversation, and no one can have that conversation about your role in the cattle business as well as you can. Michelle Payne Canoper works with farmers and ranchers to help them learn the best ways to engage with consumers. It's part of Merck Animal Health's Responsible Beef Campaign. The program was launched in May of 2013 with a vision for empowering cattle feeders to spread their message of responsible beef production. When I look at the Responsible Beef Initiative, it's about empowering cattlemen to take their future in their hands, whether it's for their children, their grandchildren, whatever it may be, and really just helping them understand that, look, I understand the culture of agriculture is modesty and independence and stubbornness, but that doesn't bode well when you need to ha have a conversation about what you're doing on the farm. So it's about helping future generations overcome some of those challenges that we've had in the past in sharing our message effectively. We really felt it was important for producers to find their voice and to tell their story. It's the people who are actually taking care of the cattle, taking care of the lands, supporting their communities, and building their businesses. As Merck Animal Health discussed ideas for the program, four areas of responsibility became top of mind. Your cattle, your land, your community, and your business. When we talk about cattle, I mean, it's, it's everything we do to, to care for the cattle and well-being and care and, and animal health and, and, and looking after the animals to make sure they're comfortable and, and happy. Then we look at land, and, and we're not making any more land. And we all know that if we don't take care of this land, it's not going to take care of us. We can pass it down to future generations. Then we have communities. Communities kind of is my favorite because it really starts with family. And when you look at the cattle industry, it's focused on family. And then the next thing would be employees. And the interesting thing about employees is, is most employees are customers too because you know, they, they enjoy a good steak and a, a good hamburger as a meal also. And then you start looking at local communities. You have local communities. It's the hardware store. It's, it's the feed store. It's your barber. It's all the people in your local community that your business supports. Business is the most important, I think, though, because if you don't have a successful business, if, you're, if your business isn't sustainable, these other things don't really matter. And so a lot of people are, are worried about talking about business and, and making money, but really it's pretty important to anybody that you were able to turn that dollar over and keep your business going. My challenge always, whether I'm working with cattlemen, whether I'm working with grain producers, or whether I'm working with scientists, is to simply find an opportunity to tell your story. And that's why I wrote No More Food Fights. When you look at the book and you consider the opportunity to really reach across the plate, in my mind, that's where our opportunity lies, is in the conversation. When Merck invited me to be a part of the Responsible Beef Initiative, it was a lot of fun because the four pillars aligned with No More Food Fights and many of the things that I had covered in the book. To me, it's about being proactive because if you only react, that will be the reference point from which people operate. Whereas if you're proactive and you stand up and you simply share a picture on Facebook or you have a conversation in, in your church parking lot about, hey, this is what we're doing this week and this is why, people start seeing inside the lives of cattle producers and they realize that they're good people. We'll have more about the Responsible Beef Program when we return. Stay with us. We stand for what we believe in. We believe in you. It's more than a job. It's your way of life. Who you are where you live, and what you do. The way you treat your cattle, your family, your employees, and your neighbors. The water you drink, the air you breathe, and the ground you walk on. What you do every day gives families something to gather around every night. It's about doing what's right for your cattle, your land, your community, and your business. It's your livelihood, and it means as much to us as it does to you. We all believe in responsible beef. Let's stand together at ResponsibleBeef.com. 
I'm an NCBA member. I'm an NCBA member because I think uh, as an advocacy group, NCBA has done some great things for our industry and I kind of feel compelled to, to give back some of what they've done for us. Because this organization is looking out for cattle producers. They understand what makes our cow-calf business profitable. Join me today. Join me today. Join NCBA today. Head to BeefUSA.org or call 866-USA-BEEF. Welcome back. Let's return to Nebraska and reporter Brian Baxter with more about the key elements of the Responsible Beef Program. The program began with a series of workshops across the U.S. The workshops included education in both large group settings and with small group hands-on discussions and training. Participants included cattle feeders, veterinarians, and nutritionists all coming together to learn how to better tell their stories of responsible beef production. Well, we've had responsible beef workshops in the Panhandle of Texas, in Kansas, in Nebraska, and Iowa, really in, in the heart of cattle feeding country. Well, the workshops really came about to, to help people understand these four pillars and also give them a chance to, to learn how to, to find their voice. My hope is that they're armed with the tools to go home and have an effective conversation about agriculture, not only about the cattle business, but really about many of the issues that are happening around the plate. It really helps uh, nutritionists and veterinarians that are working closely with their customers to, to have that voice also. It's interesting to even think about a nutritionist. You know, really they're a, a cow dietitian. Uh, that came out in one of our workshops and, and you just saw the nutritionist all of a sudden go, wow, you know, that's right, I'm the same. And so they can really relate to uh, a dietitian at a hospital or something like this where they can, they can have a, a really cool conversation about beef. The website ResponsibleBeef.com was also launched. It connects cattle feeders through feed yard specific articles, product information, and tools for their trade. The goal is for cattle feeders to feel empowered to discuss their production practices, learn new industry information, and understand Merck Animal Health's commitment to the cattle industry. We talk about what people are doing kind of cool in their, in their cattle feeding operations across the country. So, and, and we have all the pillars there. We talk about cattle, we talk about land, we talk about community, we talk about business. And, and so it supports all those pillars and we rotate new stories in. It's really a way to, to provide people some ideas on how they would talk to maybe their target audience. The Responsible Beef Campaign has been a success with crowded workshops and eager, engaged participants. Merck Animal Health plans to keep providing cattle feeders with the tools they need to spread the positive message of the beef industry. It's been very, very positive. People said, you know, I haven't realized that I needed to really focus on talking to somebody and relating with somebody before I go into talking to them about beef. And I think that was the biggest learning part. Um, one of my favorite things from the workshop that I've learned is it's, it's not what you say, it's how you make people feel is what they remember. My measure of success is if they're doing something differently in a month from now. If they're out there and they're reaching their hand out, whether it would be in a local pub, whether it would be when they're in the, with their extended family at Thanksgiving, or if they're even sharing a photo on Facebook and simply saying, hey, this is what I did and this is why, that's a huge win. Again, it's about the heart-to-heart -heart connection and it's about the personal conversations. Well, I think the best thing about having cattlemen tell the story is, is that they have a lot of value in there, and they're the people actually with their, having their boots dirty. If it was me telling the story, it wouldn't mean anything. But it's the people who are actually taking care of the cattle, taking care of the land, supporting their communities, and building their businesses. Reporting from Omaha, Nebraska, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now for more information on the Responsible Beef program, check out their website at responsiblebeef.com. We'll be cooking in the kitchen after this, so stay with us. Hi there, I'm Joey. And I'm Rory, and welcome to our farm outside Nashville, Tennessee. When we go to work, whether it's on tour or here at home, we wear the West. 
That's right. Where it's that perfect snap shirt or that perfect pair of boots. When you wear Roper, you wear the West. Learn more about us, Joey and Rory, and about Roper Western wear at eroper.com. Telling the truth and being real and feeding my family a home-cooked meal. That's important to me. That's important to me. And planting the garden and watching it grow. Hello, I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Each week, we travel the country to bring you the latest cattle industry news and information. Check us out at cattlemen2cattlemen.org or on Facebook and Twitter. is a time when Oktoberfest is celebrated in many places across our nation and Shanoa French is with us from the Culinary Innovations team with a recipe that fits perfectly with Oktoberfest. Is that right? It does. We're going to we're going to talk a little bit about bratwurst style and some sauerkraut. Perfect. So, let's start here. We actually have the sauerkraut working first for us and um, this recipe is kind of a play on the canned sauerkraut that you might buy in the grocery oh, really? store. Mm -hmm. um, it's a quick pickling, takes about 10 minutes wow. and allows you to make as much or as little as you need. We, we need just a small amount for this recipe. So Here I am a German and I've never even never heard of that. You've never made your own. Well now you can learn. Yes. So this starts and why I wanted to show you this part of the recipe is it shows that it kind of disappears in the pan okay. and that's okay you haven't done anything wrong. I so see. that's why we want to show not to add more because it'll mess up and you'll end up with extra at the end. So this is about three cups of coleslaw mix okay. and it's just shredded cabbage that you can wow. buy in the grocery store. Yeah. So if you want to use a head and shred it yourself you can yeah. or for convenience just buy three cups of shredded. Okay. Um, it's a little bit of water, mm -hmm. a little bit of brown sugar, a little bit of vinegar and some caraway seeds. Really? Yeah. So that's all find it takes. Them, that's all it takes. Find them in the in the spice aisle. Wow. There. A um, little bit of water. You put the lid on it, and you let them cook for about 10 minutes, mm. and you'll start to see that the cabbage becomes translucent, oh, and good. that's what we're looking for. Great. So I'm gonna let this sit here for a little bit, and we're gonna talk about the about sausage. the beef and the yeah. sausage. Yeah. So most people, I think, think of Oktoberfest. They think of the long more brat style. Right. Um, this is gonna be a patty. Okay. So it's easier, and, and it makes dinner for four, and you don't have to worry about trying to stuff them or do casings or any of Perfect. that. Yeah. So um, you're going to start with a pound of ground beef, okay. whatever you choose sure. at the house. And we're going to add just a couple quick ingredients, and then we'll use it on the stove. So okay. we're going to start this with a quarter of a cup of milk. Really? Yeah, so a little bit of milk. Of and yeah. I like to kind of flatten out the ground beef okay. in the bowl so that you're even dispersing of the spices as you lay them okay. in here. So next is going to be a little bit of powdered garlic. Okay. So kind of sprinkle that through. Yeah. Get it good and dispersed. Yeah, good. try to. Um, Salt and pepper. Okay. That's just your standard in the house. That's easy. You bet. And then here comes the the ones yeah, that are a little bit different. I don't even recognize those. So this one is all spice. Okay. So the nut that you, a lot of people think of probably with cookies and, sure. and pumpkin pie. So we're going to add that in there. Okay. Um, a little bit of cardamom. Really? Yeah. For those people that like chai tea mm -hmm. and some of that kind of stuff. Interesting. Just some of that flavors that okay. you'll get. And then a little bit of mace. Is okay. your last one. So Very just a good. touch of that. We're going to add that. Well, you on just the taught top. me something about spices today. <laughs> That's only half of it. And then you're going to mix them up. Um, if you want to go ahead at home, use your hands, kind of get in there, make sure that everything is, is dispersed nicely. Okay. Um, you want to make sure that the insides are just as seasoned as the outsides. Okay. So, um, Usually go ahead and, and do this with your hands. Sure. You don't want to over mix them because the more you mix them, the tougher your patties will oh, become. Oh, I see. Sure. Yeah. So kind of give them a good good mix. Sure. Um, and then you're basically going to just divide this into four. Okay. Kind of real quick, and then press them into patties. Just patties, just like you do a hamburger. Just like you would hamburgers. Sure. Yep. Absolutely. That's easy enough to do. So that's that's kind of the start of this. Yes. We're going to move in. I've got some start, and we're going to show you what we do with the next. Looks like it. Yeah. So. Um, we have three of them on here. Uh -huh. What we want to talk about is you'll start two of them and you want to just cook them until they're they're golden brown on the bottom. Okay. So you want to make sure that they're cooked all the way through. Sure. So 160 degrees internally and when you're using a thermometer at home, you want to stick the thermometer through horizontally oh. to make sure you're not touching the bottom of the pan Very good. for food safety. Yes. And 
we know that juices are not a clear determinant for doneness. So when they, a lot of people have said if you clear, run, yeah. and that's truly not not food the safe. Best so indicator. best okay. indicator is to go ahead and use a thermometer. Um, once they're about halfway cooked, you're gonna flip them over. Okay. So that way you can make wow. sure that they get seared on both sides. Those are looking good. Yeah, and once you have um, a nice golden brown, mm -hmm. the next step, and we're gonna go ahead and start plating one of these, okay. is you're gonna take a piece of Swiss cheese. Sure. So the rest of the build on, on these, um, Sandwiches, and we're using pretzel buns. Oh. And I think a lot of times when you go over to Germany, they think of pretzels sure. and beer yeah. and, and bratwurst. So that's kind of how it ties it all together. Very good. Pretzel buns are kind of the hot rave right now. I've noticed that. Yeah. So you add a little bit of mustard. Okay. Either English mustard or German mustard, whatever you like on the bottom. Sure. And if you give this a minute or two in a hot pan, your cheese will kind of melt, melt. down around it. Sure. So we're going to pretend that that's, that's done. Melted. Yeah. Yes. And you're going to stick one right here on top. Very good. And then you're gonna take a little bit of your coleslaw that you made, or your sauerkraut. Sauerkraut. Yeah, I was originally say. coleslaw. Yeah. And um, top right there on the top of your your burger. Wow. And you're gonna go ahead. That's a nice new twist on, on, on the old hamburger yeah. and uh, gives you something to celebrate around October. Just a little different flavor profile. Well, it looks to me like uh, that may be even something to try in the summer months too. Thanks for bringing this recipe. You're welcome. For this and other outstanding recipes, visit beefitswhatsfordinner.com or our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. No storm is too powerful for new Purina wind and rain storm minerals formulated with ultimate weather resistance. That means more minerals in the feeder and available to your cattle. Wind and rainstorm minerals provide more consistent intake and balanced mineral nutrition to optimize herd health and breedback rates. See the difference at your local Purina dealer or visit CattleNutrition.com. Wind and rainstorm minerals, another way Purina is building better cattle. To stay up to date on beef industry news and the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, check out BeefUSA.org. You'll find news on both the Federation of State Beef Councils and the work of NCBA on Capitol Hill. Plus, link to NCBA programs like the blog, Beltway Beef, updates on the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show, and the latest from NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Connect today at BeefUSA.org. Welcome back. Getting hay cut and baled in a timely way was a challenge this year for many cattlemen as cooler, wetter weather impacted days in the field and also drying times. Still, many producers reported a banner year for hay production. Now, the question is whether the hay is stored well enough to avoid damage and deterioration. More on the critical importance of hay storage from Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter. For a cattleman, it's a good feeling to head into winter with plenty of hay on hand, but the size of the supply is not the best indicator of feed value. Hay quality is real important. Uh, just because you have a roll of hay doesn't mean you have quality feed. Uh, I would tell anybody that if they, the best thing to do is to get you a bale sample if you're buying any hay. Uh, we check our hay protein to make sure it's good, therefore we know what to we need to do with our supplements of mineral or, or lick feed to go along with our hay. Uh, that's a very important. You can have many tons of hay and not have anything if you don't have any quality. Dan Taylor has a commercial cow herd in South Georgia and produces hay for his own use and for customers. Dan's hay is typically stored outside so it is subject to weather. And for all those storing hay, climate is a big factor to consider. So really when we talk about climate type, we're specifically uh, talking about annual rainfall. Um, and so depending on what part of the country you're in, uh, generally speaking, most cattlemen probably fall, particularly in the, in the east and midwest, in the 20 to 40 inches of rainfall per year, uh, which means that they're going to have some pretty adverse effects on dry matter loss in their bales. They're going to see uh, a lot of dry matter loss all, out over time, which is going to equate to less hay or less feed in the bale. Producers in areas where rainfall might be under 10 inches per year have less to worry about in terms of weather-related losses to their stored hay. But for those in higher moisture areas, 
dry matter loss due to weather can be as high as 25 to 50 percent. So what are the keys to protecting the dry matter and quality of stored hay? First is bale density. Uh, when we talk about bale density, uh, there's a difference between a low density bale and a high density bale. Uh, we typically look for that density value to be around uh, 10 pounds per cubic foot, which means that that bale will have the ability to uh, shed water a little better and hold up to more moves a little better as well, depending on how many times cattlemen are moving it before they're feeding the bale. Bale density is important for several reasons. Number one is, if the bale is dense, then there are fewer bales being made in the field. So the fewer the bales there are being made in the field, there are fewer bales there are to retrieve and to tie and to put twine on. So it actually uh, reduces the cost for the operator. Secondly, uh, if the bale is dense, then it's going to be uh, able to weather less if it's left outside. So that means it sheds water better, and that's also important. If it weathers less, then you can keep more of the nutritional value of the plant that you've cut and packaged. The BR7000 series round baler from New Holland can help cattlemen achieve high density bales for lower storage losses. The New Holland baler will make a dense bale because of the roll belt concept that it was designed with. And that is, first of all, it has a combination of belts and rollers. The two top rollers are on a sledge arm that pivots forward as the core size grows, but there's tremendous pressure underneath that material and it's going to make a, a, a dense bale. And then uh, the hydraulic pressure is uh, going to take over when the belts uh, have control of the bale during the last two-thirds of the formation of the package itself and uh, the operator can control the density by changing the uh, density control there on his valve on the hydraulics. With a combination of rollers and belts, we have the densest bale in the baler industry. We'll have more tips on the best way to store your hay right after this. Stay with us. New Holland is smart for the way you farm. And New Holland round balers are smart for the way you raise cattle. By focusing on making the densest bale possible, New Holland round balers pack more into each bale, saving you time, fuel, and money. Now that's smart. We can also match your feeding requirements with a variety of bale slicing, cutting, and wrapping options to help maximize your time. Plus, with models designed specifically for silage or specialty crop harvest, New Holland gives you the power to make smart choices to fit your farm or ranch. You work hard to get the most out of every hay season to benefit you and your cattle. From mower conditioners to balers and tractors, New Holland has the right solutions to help you make quality hay and forage for your cattle operation. Visit your New Holland dealer to learn more about the complete lineup of New Holland equipment, in addition to all the benefits available to cattle producers. Welcome back. Let's return to South Georgia and reporter Brian Baxter with more on the best ways to store and protect your hay. The dense uniform bales produced by the New Holland 7000 series of roll belt round balers is a result of several design factors, including the ability for the operator to dial in the bale density desired. So the take up arms can actually move because oil is in this cylinder right here. This is a self-contained system. We're not getting hydraulic oil from the tractor. You know the beauty of that is if you borrow your neighbor's tractor and his has got contaminated oil, it won't hurt your baler. That's what's so neat about this. So the oil has got to flow in one end of the cylinder and come back out the other. This is just a block valve right here that dictates how hard it is for that oil to make its journey. And you can change the density by restricting how hard it is for these take-up arms to move by rotating this right here. Turn it one way to make a denser bale, turn it the opposite way to make a little less dense bale. 
And that's the great thing about the take-up arms, and that's how that works. The hydraulic density system also includes a gauge at the front of the baler, and you can see here, and it's in numerical values there with the PSI. So if you raise the tailgate and you're at, say, 2100 PSI, and that's too dense, and you, you can crank back, dial back on it and have one at less. And you know you can also document what you made the bale at. If you made bales that you liked at 1600 PSI, you don't have to know what color they were in, you just know it was at 1600. So that's what's so neat about that gauge. After bale density, another factor to consider in maintaining hay quality is using net wrap instead of twine. When we use the twine, uh, our quality would be the same except for the waste that we would have on the outside of the bale. It would go to, uh, to rottening more so on the, on the bottom and, and top, but being that we use the wrap, it keeps the bale more uniform, so there's less of the bale actually sitting on the ground. Well, the major difference between wrapping with uh, net and twine is the ability of the bale to shed water. Uh, bales that are wrapped with net are going to be able to do two things. Uh, number one, they're going to shed water from the sky a lot better than twine will. And the second thing is they will wick less water up from the ground. Uh, because when bales are sitting on the ground, that ground is really like a sponge that absorbs water and that bale will absorb some of that water as well. Uh, so bales stored on the ground will weather better with net versus twine and mostly all conditions. Our bales are stored outside. We, we do not have uh, enough shelter room for all of it. Uh, in a, in a, if we had our spring, uh, the amount of rain that we had this, this spring uh, would have been devastating if we'd had a, uh, not had been using our wrap. Here's the net spool. We call this the front loaded net spool. You know when you're making hay, it just comes natural to want to look back and see how you're doing. And it's the same way when you're putting your uh, string or twine on even the netting too. So we've put the net spool at the front so that the operator can look back and see that the net spool is actually engaged in doing its job. Another thing that's neat about this is the netting itself doesn't have far to travel until it lands where it's gonna live on the face of the bale. So it's fast and it's easy to load and you load from the front and it's easy to see. You can look through these holes here in the front and know when it's rotating. In addition to preserving the quality of stored bales, the net wrap system on the BR7000 series of balers also allows producers to get their hay baled and out of the field more quickly. Advantages of the net wrap, uh, first and foremost, it's time. Usually when people think about should I net or should I twine, you get into a quick discussion about the fact that netting uh, is a lot more productive because it takes so much less time. And a fellow who may uh, be using twine or string may take a minute and 15, a minute and 30 seconds to tie and to dump the bale. Whereas the guy with the net mechanism may take 12 to 16 seconds. So it's a lot faster. If it's a lot faster over the course of a seven or eight hour day, it can mean that you can put up a lot more bales. From climate to bale density to net wrap, the factors influencing hay quality and storage can now be easily compared using decision-making tools from New Holland. A bale storage slide calculator or a new bale wrap application for use on a tablet. We offer both a, uh, a paper copy version of a uh, bale storage loss calculator in addition to a bale wrap app uh, where uh, cattlemen can put in their, their own values for their operation and calculate what their potential dry matter loss is and, and tons saved using, using net wrap and particular storage types. For example, if today I'm wrapping with net but storing my bales on the ground, I can compare that to perhaps storing my bales on a crushed rock pad covered with a tarp or maybe just covered with a tarp on the ground to compare my dry matter losses and what savings I might see per ton uh, by switching up a couple of my practices if I'm storing my bales for six to 12 months. So both of those tools are available to producers to evaluate what's best for them so that they can get the, the most out of the hay that they've got stored. And getting the most out of the hay you've stored can make all the difference when it comes to keeping your cattle and your balance sheet in good condition through the feeding season. From South Georgia, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. 
You can get your own free copy of the bale storage slide calculator. It's a handy reference tool and you can get your own copy from New Holland Agriculture simply by calling toll free 1-888-346-6910 right now. And don't forget, you can also download the New Holland bale wrap application. Just visit Google Play or iTunes and search for bale wrap app to download a version for your own tablet. We'll have more right after this. Tough trailers built for tough country. Big Bend Trailers manufactures a different kind of trailer, one that's built to put up with the rough conditions found on the ranch. Rugged built using heavy gauge powder coated steel and a two by four rectangle tube frame. There's a one inch gap between the side and floor, so there's no place for water or manure to accumulate and rust. Big Bend trailers are loaded with standard features, a lever action hitch, a three foot escape gate, and a middle sorting gate, rhino lining along the front edges, and a receiver hitch to tow another trailer, chute, or other equipment. Tough and practical, that's Big Bend trailers, Designed and built by a working cattleman, you can rely on and trust Big Ben trailers for their durability and convenient features. Reasonably priced for any rancher to afford. For a list of dealers and other design features, visit BigBenTrailers.com. Big Ben Trailers, built cattlemen tough. It's the official monthly publication of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. The National Cattleman is produced exclusively for NCBA members and includes coverage of the news and events affecting our industry. From Capitol Hill to the far side of cattle country, the National Cattleman provides information NCBA members need. Every issue includes market analysis, feature stories, and practical management tips. Start receiving your copy of The National Cattleman. Call 866-USA-BEEF or go online to BeefUSA.org and join today. We know who made that hitch. We know who cut the steel, who milled the ball, and who welded the seams. We know who tested, measured, and checked. We even know who thought the whole thing up. We're B&W, and we know your hitch. Because we don't make them halfway around the world. We make them all right here. B&W. Trusted. Feeding the world is a big job. The Dr. Kenneth and Caroline McDonald Inc. Foundation has committed more than $2 million to fund research at the University of Nebraska, Oklahoma State University, and Texas A&M University to improve efficiency in the cattle industry and to hold an annual cow-calf symposium. The first symposium was held at the University of Nebraska Lincoln on September 12th and 13th. This cow feeding research supports the entire beef industry. When you hire onto a cowboy crew, you're working with all kinds of different cowboys. Some of them are top hands, I mean, can rope and ride and go with the best of them. And then you got the kind of guys that just ease along, do their part, and but you don't expect too much. And then there's always that one or two that you wonder what in the world are they doing here in the first place? It's a land of nitwits. Nitwits are partial to wisdom that's usually corny and trite. But the worst part of nitwit wisdom is when the nitwit is right. Now, I was riding pasture for Brim Hall, checking for bad eyes and such. He'd hired this nitwit to help me. Brim Hall never did like me much. Well, you can't be good at everything, said nitwit, missing the steer. I had to agree that he wasn't. Good, that is. That much was clear. I chased the steer and caught the head. I dallied, then I spoke. You rope the hawks and we'll stretch him out. He tried, but it was a joke. Here, set my horse and hold the head. We swapped and I roped the hind. Now take back your horse and hold the heels and don't let no slack in your twine. I got off to doctor the steer and fished for my last syringe. When a hoof lashed out and cracked my hand and doubled my arm like a hinge. 
I stabbed myself with a needle. He kicked me under the chin and then rolled me off over backwards, driving the needle on in. Don't let go of your dally. Dang. His rope was flopping around the steer, stepped out of the heel loop and headed for higher ground. You sorry excuse for nothing. You lying bread drizzling dope. I guess you saw he's still dragging my brand new 40 foot rope. You're dumber than boiled gravel. I told you to keep your slack tight. Now you probably die of pneumonia. We watched him flee out of sight. Well, look on the bright side, said Nitwit. His wisdom cut to the quick. The way that old steer quit the country, he couldn't have been that sick. <laughs> this is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks for those team building tips, Baxter. Now, in case you hadn't noticed, it's already November and we're counting down the days until the 2014 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It will feature valuable education with the 21st edition of Cattlemen's College, plus great speakers, outstanding entertainment, and an awesome NCBA trade show, and a whole lot of fun. I'll be there. Will you? Mark your calendars for next February 4th through 7th at the Opryland Hotel in Nashville. And you can register right now at beefusa.org. For this week's legacy photos, we're heading to the Sand Hills of Nebraska for a closer look at the ranches along Gracie Creek. Let's have a look. Don't forget, you can send us pictures of your farm or ranch by visiting our website. That's cattleman to cattleman.org. Next week on NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll be live from Denver with an update on the state of the U.S. beef cattle industry. And we'll be taking your calls and questions live on the air. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you right back here next week on RFD TV.